Down Pens by Saki. Have you written to thank the Frolopsons for what they sent us? asked Egbert. Well, no, said Janetta with a note of tired defiance in her voice. I've written eleven letters today expressing surprise and gratitude for sundry unmerited gifts, but I haven't written to the Frolopsons. Someone will have to write to them, said Egbert. Oh, I don't dispute the necessity, but I don't think like the someone should be me, said Janetta. I wouldn't mind writing a letter of angry recrimination or heartless satire to some suitable recipient. In fact, I should rather enjoy it. But I've come to the end of my capacity for expressing servile amiability. Eleven letters today and nine yesterday, all couched in the same strain of ecstatic thankfulness. Really, you can't expect me to sit down to another. There's such a thing as writing oneself out. Well, I've written nearly as many, said Egbert, and I've had my usual business correspondence to get through, too. Besides, I don't know what it was that the Frolopsons sent us. A William the Conqueror calendar, said Janetta, with a quotation of one of his great thoughts for every day in the year. Impossible, said Egbert. He didn't have 365 thoughts in the whole of his life, or if he did, he kept them to himself. He was a man of action, not of introspection. Well, it was William Wordsworth, then, said Janetta. I know William came into it somewhere. Well, that sounds more probable, said Egbert. Well, let's collaborate on this letter of thanks and get it done. I'll dictate. You can scribble it down. Dear Mrs. Frolpson, thank you and your husband so much for the very pretty calendar you sent us. It was very good of you to think of us. Well, you can't possibly say that, said Janetta, laying down her pen. It's always what I always do and say, and that's what everyone says to me, protested Egbert. Well, we sent them something on the 22nd, said Janetta. So they simply had to think of us. There was no getting away from it. What did we send them? said Egbert gloomily. Bridge markers, said Janetta, in a cardboard case with some inanity about digging for fortune with a royal spade emblazoned on the cover. The moment I saw it in the shop, I said to myself, Frolopsons, and to the attendant, How much? When he said nine pence, I gave him their address, jabbed our card in, paid ten pence or eleven pence to cover the postage, and thanked heaven. With less sincerity and infinitely more trouble than they eventually thanked me. But the Frolopsons don't play bridge, said Egbert. One is not supposed to notice social deformities of that sort, said Janetta. It wouldn't be polite. Besides, what trouble did they take to find out whether we read Wordsworth with gladness? For all they knew or cared, we might be frantically embedded with the belief that all poetry begins and ends with John Maysfield, and they might infuriate or depress us to have a daily sample of Wordsworthian products flung at us. Well, let's get on with the letter of thanks, said Egbert. Proceed, said Janetta. How clever of you to guess that Wordsworth is our famous, our favorite poet, dictated Egbert. Again, Janetta laid down her pen. Do you realize what that means, she asked. A Wordsworth booklet next Christmas and another calendar the Christmas after, with the same problem of having to write suitable letters of thankfulness. No, the best thing to do is drop all further allusion to the calendar and switch off onto some other topic. But what other topic? Oh, something like this. What do you think of the New Year honors lists? A friend of ours made such a clever remark when he read it. Then you can stick in any remark that comes into your head. It needn't be clever. The Frolopsons won't know whether it is or isn't. We don't even know on which side they are in politics, objected Egbert. And anyhow, you can't suddenly dismiss the subject of the calendar. Surely there must be some intelligent remark that can be made about it. Well, we can't think of one, said Janetta wearily. The fact is, we've both written ourselves out. Heavens, I've just remembered Mrs. Stephen Ludbury. I haven't thanked her for what she sent. What did she send? Oh, I forget. I think it was a calendar. There was a long silence, and the forlorn silence of those who are bereft of hope and have almost ceased to care. Presently, Egbert started from his seat with an air of resolution. The light of battle was in his eyes. Let me come to the writing table, he exclaimed. Oh, gladly, said Janetta. Are you going to write to Mrs. Ledbury or the Frolpsons? To neither, said Egbert, drawing a stack of notepaper towards him. I'm going to write to the editor of every enlivened and influential newspaper in the kingdom. I'm going to suggest there should be a sort of epistolary truce of God during the festivities of Christmas and New Year. From the 24th of December to the 3rd or 4th of January, it shall be considered an offense against good sense and good feeling to write or expect any letter of communication that does not deal with the necessary events of the moment. Answers to invitations or arrangements about trains, 
renewal of club subscriptions, and of course, all the ordinary everyday affairs of business, sickness, engaging new cooks, and so forth, these will be dealt with in the usual manner as something inevitable, a legitimate part of our daily life. But all the devastating accretions of correspondence incident to the festive season, these should be swept away to give the season a chance of being really festive, a time of untroubled, unpunctuated peace and goodwill. But you would have to make some acknowledgement of presents received, objected Janetta. Otherwise, people would never know whether they'd arrived safely. Oh, of course, I've thought of that, said Egbert. Every present that was sent off would be accompanied by a ticket bearing the date of dispatch and the signature of the center, and some conventional hieroglyphic to show that it was intended to be a Christmas or New Year gift. There would be a counterfoil with space for the recipient's name and the date of arrival, and all you'd have to do would be sign and date the counterfoil. Add a conventional hieroglyphic indicating heartfelt thanks and gratified surprise. Put the thing into an envelope and post it. Well, it sounds delightfully simple, said Janetta wistfully. But people would consider it too cut and dried, too perfunctory. It's not a bit more perfunctory than the present system, said Egbert. I've only the same conventional language of gratitude at my disposal with which to thank dear old Colonel Chuddle for his perfectly delicious Stilton, which we shall devour to the last morsel and the Frolipsons for their calendar, which we shall never look at. Colonel Chettle knows we're grateful for the Stilton without having to be told so, and the Frolipsons know we're bored with their calendar, whatever we may say to the contrary. Just as we know, they're bored with the bridge markers in spite of their written assurance that they thanked us for our charming little gift. What is more, the Colonel knows that even if we had taken a sudden aversion to Stilton, or been forbidden it by the doctor, we should still have written a letter of hearty thanks around it. So you see, the present system of acknowledgement is just as perfunctory and conventional as the counterfoil business would be, only ten times more tiresome and brain-racking. Well, your plan would certainly bring the ideal of a happy Christmas a step nearer to realization, said Janetta. There are exceptions, of course, said Egbert. People who really try to infuse a breath of reality into their letters of acknowledgement. Aunt Susan, for instance, who writes, Thank you very much for the ham, not such a good flavor as the one you sent last year, which itself was not a particularly good one. Hams are not what they used to be. It would be a pity to be deprived of her Christmas comments, but that loss would be swallowed up in the general gain. Meanwhile, said Janetta, what am I to say to the Frolipsons? <laughs>